You mentioned in your introduction your fascination with the subject, but obviously it's a very long journey to get from being fascinated with something to where we are tonight. Could you tell us a little bit about how long the journey took, and particularly um, the research that you did, because I know that you did a massive amount of research. Um, well, I, I would say it took about three years. Um, to get to the point where I felt like I was in a position to be able to write the script. So, three years of reading and meeting people and interviewing and legwork and uh, um, meeting people who knew the Duchess um, uh, or the Duke. Um, watching every documentary ever made. Going to archival libraries doing tons and tons of research. Meeting anyone who ever, who, who had a letter, who owned a letter who had uh, a connection to somebody who had a letter. I did read an enormous amount of letters because uh, in spite of all the books that have been written about uh, Wallace and Edward VIII and the royal family and this period of time, I found that reading the letters was the most insightful um, way into the story and the best way to get to know them because when you write letters to somebody, you don't know that someone else is going to read them, just the person you're writing the letter to. So you get to have an inside and an insight um, that you wouldn't have by reading a book that someone's writing knowing that other people are going to read it. And I mean, I think it's very refreshing as someone who grew up in this country and was, you know, told a certain history of the relationship and, you know, we were all sort of given the story of Edward who gave up everything for her. Telling, her, telling it more from her point of view and, you know, giving us some insight into what she gave up. Is that something that evolved during the research or were you always kind of more interested? I, I think I was most, I was drawn into the story by, by first trying to understand why uh, a person in such a powerful position would give up something um, like that. Um, for, for love, it seemed like such a huge um, sacrifice and in a way, you know, to me, I thought it was incredibly brave um, to, because men are power-seeking creatures um, by nature, and to, in most, most of them are um, fighting their way to the throne. So the idea that someone would give up this perceived power and position for love was fascinating to me. So I was trying to um, uncover what I perceived to be this great romance. And in the uncovering of the story, I saw a whole other point of view, and I saw what she went through. I saw how she ran away from it. I saw how she saw the writing on the wall and knew that it was all gonna go tits up. Um, <laughs> excuse my French. So, um, so you know, it, it was, to me, you know, when, when Wally goes to Alfie Thomas and says, I think it's important to tell the story from her point of view, that was really the conclusion I came to at the end of all my research. And at what point did you decide to integrate in the more modern story, the story of Wally? Well, I think it's important to understand and accept that truth is subjective. And, you know, we all can read stories and do as much research as we want on a person. Um, but but what we, how we interpret the story and what we take away from it is always going to be different than somebody else. So um, it was important. I never set out to make the quintessential um, you know, historical biopic of, of you know, the abdication of Edward VIII or you know, the true story about what lies behind the romance of Wallace and Edward. Um, I thought it was important to give the story a point of view and, and to make, you know, remind the audience that, it, that this is the story seen through the eyes of a young woman who's, who's searching for love and, and the meaning of happiness. And you co-wrote the script with Alec Kishishun, who you've worked with before. Can you tell us a little bit, in kind of practical terms, how that process worked? Did you pass drafts between each other, or you literally wrote together? How did you do that? We sat in a room and threatened each other if we didn't get off of our blackberries. First of all, I had to hide his more than he had to hide mine. And um, we just we we um, shared a, a computer and. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. We had the script up on the big screen and we just passed it back and forth. And 
and uh, we just kind of riffed off of each other and, and we, we spent weeks together writing and then we'd go away and we'd read the drafts and then we'd change scenes and email them to each other and then we'd spend time together again writing and just went on like that for about a year and a half. Yeah. And do you enjoy the process of writing? I love the process of writing. It's nice because nobody butts in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could just do it on your own. Yeah. It always sounds very appealing. Yeah. Um, so then, as compared with the process of filming, you had three countries to shoot in and what, a hundred or so locations? Three countries. Um, um, well, 43 um, different locations, um, 83 costume changes for the Duchess. Um, yeah, it was a location, costume, jewelry, hair and makeup, hungry kind of a film. Yeah. But you enjoyed the filming? Or? Yeah, I did. I did. It was tough. I'm not going to lie. But um, I did enjoy it. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is the visual style of the film, which I think is beautiful. Particularly, I wanted to ask you about your choice of uh, cinematographer and the decision to shoot on different stocks and different gauges. Can you talk us through some of the thinking behind that? I, I, I'm glad you're mentioning Hagen Bodansky. He is a brilliant cinematographer, and I was really lucky to have him. Um, I love his work. He, he, felt he um, shot Young Victoria and um, Lives of Others, which I think are both brilliant movies. Um, so we, I chose to shoot it on, you know, the, the majority of the film on 35 millimeter. And then I wanted to use the 16 millimeter as a kind of punctuation mark in scenes when I wanted to come closer and have a, a sense of greater intimacy. And then the Super 8 we shot on was meant to evoke um, you know, when you when you see a Super 8 film, you always think it, it, you know it's nostalgic, and it, it, you say you think to yourself, "Oh, that's a home movie. That's there's a there's a something really amateur about it, and and user friendly, and it brings you closer to the character, and it makes you feel like you're getting also once again like the letters an insight into that character. So, and it's a very fluid camera. Can you, again, were there, were there kind of other films that influenced you in terms of wanting to shoot in that style, or was it just how you felt that story should be visually told? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Steadicam, and uh, you know, I, wa I wanted the camera to have a lyricism about it because I wanted, I thought, I wanted to make the stories weave together and, and the love affairs between, in, in, in both the modern world and, and in the past, um, to be like a dance. And so that's easier to achieve with steady hand. Um, one of the films that really influenced me was La Vie en Rose. Um, there's a lot of use of steady cam in that film, and I really admire the way that scenes, there's one scene that goes on for five minutes without any cuts. And um, I tried to achieve that a few times in the movie. Um, and I think it's bold filmmaking because I think we're so used to watching movies with tons of edits and cuts. And, um, so that, that movie influenced me, the camera work in it. And I'm also a big uh, fan of tracking shots. And I would say that um, a film by Alain René called uh, Last Year at Marion Vaughan really influenced me as well. He did a lot of tracking shots and shooting into mirrors and that um, inspired me. Just thinking about the Delphine Seyri costumes in that too. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think we'll talk about costumes in a moment, but before that, can I ask you about the casting of the film and particularly, I mean, obviously very pivotal who you found to play Wallace. How easy was it to find Andrea? That was, um, well, getting to Andrea was a long, um, arduous journey. I, I met with a lot of actresses, a lot of really great actresses. This was really painful for me because a lot of actresses I really wanted to work with came to meet me and it was really hard saying no to them because they just weren't right for the part. And I had brought up Andrea's name several times and many people frowned at me because they said she's too young, she can't play that kind of an age range, etc. And I just, I saw her playing Margaret Thatcher and 
and I thought she was so brilliant, and I thought she transformed herself in that film. And, and um, so I met her, and when she walked in the room, to me, she was the Duchess. She had she had dressed, and you know, in the way that the Duchess had dressed and done her hair and makeup and her long neck and the way she moved her hands and her carriage and the combination of steeliness and fragility that she had. I, I was, you know, I was thrilled because I, in my head, I was thinking, oh my God, I found her. So, and just a little about working with actors. I mean, obviously you've acted yourself. Do you think that makes a difference in terms of how you interact and direct your actors? Yes, um, I always appreciated working on films where the, act, where the director gave me as much support and direction as possible and gave me as much information about my character as possible. I think actors want direction. Um, they want, even if, it's, even if you disagree with it in the end, they want to know what your point of view is. So um, I try to, to be that for my actors. And I think I would be in dereliction of duties if we didn't talk about the costumes, um, which are absolutely divine. Yes. <laughs> um, and you worked with Ariane Phillips, again, someone who you've worked with. Yeah, I've worked with Ariane for years and years. She's done a lot of things with me, um, all of my shows and tons of videos and, and photo shoots. And she's done a lot of great films herself. <coughs> and. Um, I think she has impeccable taste, and I had to um, do a lot of begging to get her to move to London for, for six months, but she did, and uh, I was really lucky to have her. She did an amazing job. And some of the Duchess's costumes are recreations of actual costumes that she Yes, um, both v &A and Christian Dior, who designed a lot of clothes for her um, when she was alive, uh, recreated a lot of the um, wardrobe for us. We're very grateful for that. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I wanted to ask you was, um, and I guess it will touch on some of the things that you've talked about already, really what you hope that people will take away from the film. <laughs> well, lots of things. I mean, the, I think it's quite a complex story and it, you can enjoy it or take it in on a lot of different levels. I think one really important point is that there is no such thing as perfect love. And if you think so, then you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> um, and, and that real love requires compromise. And um, the other thing is, is, the other message or idea that I hope people come away with is that nothing is what it seems that you could read a story or hear about somebody or know about someone or something. And you know, there's always many sides to the story. So it pays to investigate and do your research. And before you come to a conclusion about somebody or something, make sure you've gathered as much evidence as possible. That sounds like a great note to finish on. Congratulations on the film and thank you so much for being here.